world news tonight. Ravaging floods, China sinks under Mother Nature's latest punishment. Delta domination, deadly diseases take over the world as a particular variant wreaks havoc. Fuel ties, global superpowers shake hands on a deal of controversy. Tracing space, NASA sets out on a mission to find life from beyond. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the raging floods in China. Twelve people have died so far amidst the devastating floods and about 200,000 people have been evacuated to safe zones. Many train services across Henan have also been suspended. Many highways have also been closed and flights delayed or cancelled. Stunning scenes in a subway in central China. Passengers trapped inside flooded train cars, posting horrifying videos to social media. My phone will run out of power soon, she says. The water rising higher, others clinging to handles. It took hours for rescuers to reach them. A dozen people didn't make it out alive. Across the city of Zhengzhou, people were stranded. Kids floated out of a kindergarten in plastic bins. Nearly a year's worth of rain falling in just three days, what forecasters called a once-in-a-thousand-years event. The torrential rain has forced 100,000 people to relocate. As China's army scrambles to shore up dams, now at risk of bursting. The United States and Germany announced a deal to allow the completion of a controversial Russian gas pipeline to Europe without the imposition of further U.S. sanctions. The agreement aims to staunch fears about European dependence on the Russian energy, but it was immediately sated by critics who said it doesn't go far enough. It's currently 98% complete. But now, some of the last diplomatic pieces have clicked into place, allowing the controversial Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline to be finished. Washington and Berlin have healed their long-running rift over the project by agreeing to act if Moscow tries to use the conduit for political gain. The United States and Germany are united in their determination to hold Russia to account for its aggression and malign activities by imposing costs via sanctions and other tools. President Putin and Chancellor Merkel have spoken by telephone this Wednesday and are both satisfied that the Mammoth Pipeline, which runs from Russia to Germany via the Baltic Sea, is now in its final phase. This new US-German deal, however, comes with no American sanctions attached. The State Department has made it crystal clear that while Washington won't block this $11 billion pipeline, it's still not in favour of it. Others in Washington are also unimpressed, with the Republican Senator Ted Cruz claiming that President Biden is not just in bed with his Russian counterpart, but that now they're spooning. And while the deal also offers alternative energy funding and other development projects to Ukraine and Poland, countries both bypassed by the pipeline, the foreign ministers there still aren't happy. They say Wednesday's decision has created additional political, military and energy threats for the central European region. Smoke and ash from massive wildfires in the American West clouded the sky and led to air quality alerts on parts of the East Coast in the effects of the blazes were felt 2,500 miles away. Burning hotter, faster, and more explosive than ever before, tonight wildfires in the West are threatening homes and lives. Firefighters say what's unfolding here is more than one disaster feeding off another. Historic drought is the perfect fuel for these epic conditions. But it's climate change creating infernos larger than ever, with vortex of smoke powerful enough to spawn their own weather systems. The unimaginable is becoming routine. Fire Chief Brian Fennessy and his crew say what's already been lost is devastating, but what's still at risk is mind-boggling. 
While extreme conditions aren't new, the intensity and duration is. This year, Texas was buried under historic snow and ice. Tropical storms and hurricanes are forming earlier in the season. Catastrophic floods are becoming routine. And as cool climates record record heat, 94% of the West is in drought, with 64% in the critical category of extreme drought. Scientists say greenhouse gases must be reduced as a start to the solution. Tonight as scorching fires burn the West, toxic smoke drifts thousands of miles and chokes the East. The sun tainted red in its soupy haze, our planet's beauty and its peril in one. Still in the United States, four drugs companies in the United States have agreed to pay up to $26 billion to settle claims that they fooled in an opioid addiction crisis in the country. Individual states and local governments will now have to sign up for the deal, but there are divisions over how the payment will be shared. I made a commitment to them. Um, when I ran in as the attorney general, what I, that I would do all that in my power to provide some solace to them. A group of state attorneys general unveiled on Wednesday a landmark $26 billion settlement with large drug companies for allegedly fueling the deadly nationwide opioid epidemic. New York Attorney General Letitia James spoke at a virtual news conference on Wednesday. The trail of destruction and tragedy um, has basically ravaged every corner of New York and just about every region of this nation. And to be clear, the numerous companies that manufactured and distributed this poison did so without any regard for human life and for the national crisis that they caused. Under the settlement proposal, the three largest U.S. drug distributors, McKesson Corporation, Cardinal Health, and Amerisource Bergen Corporation, are expected to pay a combined $21 billion, while drug maker Johnson & Johnson would pay $5 billion. More than 3,000 lawsuits related to the health crisis, mostly by state and local governments, have been filed. States will have 30 days to evaluate the agreement. To receive the full payout, the agreement needs widespread support. But not all states are jumping on board. Washington State's Attorney General Bob Ferguson already said he would not join the deal, arguing that the settlement was not nearly good enough for his state. The opioid crisis has been blamed for hundreds of thousands of U.S. overdose deaths since 1999, with the CDC saying last week that data showed that 2020 was a record year for overall drug overdose deaths with more than 93,000, up 30% from a year earlier. The number two diplomats from South Korea, the United States and Japan met in Tokyo for talks for boosting three-way cooperation. They also agreed to work together on North Korea relation issues. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan agreed to work together on Korean Peninsula issues at a vice ministerial meeting on Wednesday in Tokyo. Speaking at a press conference afterwards, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman said that Seoul-Washington-Tokyo cooperation has sent a critical message to the North. Seoul's Vice Foreign Minister Choi jong gun said they exchanged views on the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, stressing the need for trilateral cooperation because it's an issue that takes a long time to resolve. Japan's Vice Foreign Minister Takeru Mori stressed the importance of implementing UN Security Council resolutions on North Korea while asking for cooperation to resolve the issue of North Korea's abduction of Japanese citizens four decades ago. This was the first three-way vice ministerial meeting in four years, and it came as Seoul-Tokyo relations hit a fresh low following recent inappropriate remarks by a senior Seoul-based Japanese diplomat about President Moon Jae-in, as well as a series of historical and territorial issues. Both the South Korean and Japanese vice foreign ministers have agreed to continue dialogue. The three diplomats also discussed issues related to Myanmar, climate change, global health and the economic recovery. In the readout, the U.S. State Department said they affirmed the need to maintain an inclusive, free and open Indo-Pacific and opposition to any instability in the East China Sea. After her time in Tokyo, Sherman arrived in Seoul on Wednesday night and had a meeting with South Korean Foreign Minister Chong Uyung on Thursday morning.
She reportedly plans for meetings with high-level Korean officials in the afternoon, and on Friday, she will have separate talks with her Korean counterpart, Choi jong gon Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. 100 Nigerians consisting of mostly women and children have been successfully recovered from the hands of notorious abduction gangs. Nigerian police have secured the release of 100 captives, including women, children and nursing mothers, who were abducted from their village over a month ago. A police spokesman on Wednesday said they were kidnapped from Manawa village in the country's northwest. Nigeria is battling an increase in armed robberies and kidnappings for ransom. Thinly deployed security forces have struggled to contain the rise of armed gangs, commonly referred to as bandits. While Nigeria has faced a decade of insecurity, including attacks by Islamist militants, including Islamic State's allies Boko Haram, the current wave of kidnappings is primarily financially motivated. A Lagos-based consultancy firm, SBM Intelligence, estimates that kidnappers took over 2,300 people across Nigeria in the first half of this year, demanding ransoms totaling $24 million. A Russian rocket has departed the Baikonur Cosmodrome, Kazakhstan, to deliver a new science module to the International Space Station. To give us an update on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent, Malsha Patiraja, who joins us now from Kursk in Russia. Malsha? Yes, Shanali. The 13-meter-long 20-ton Nauka laboratory will go on the rear of the orbiting platform, connected to the other major Russian segments, Zevzda and Zarya. The new module carries with it a large robotic arm supplied by the European Space Agency. Nauka is much delayed. It was originally supposed to launch in 2007. But it suffered rep repeated slips in the schedule, in part because of the budget difficulties but also because engineers encountered a draft of technical problems during the development. The module will result in a significant boost in habitable volume for the ISS, raising it by 70 cubic meters. Cosmonauts will use the extra space to conduct experiments and to store cargo. They will also use it as a rest area. Moscow officials recently warned about the more than 20-year-old of some of their on-orbit hardware and intimated the country cloud country could pull out of the station in 2025. Russia has shown little interest in joining the US-led US -led lunar platform known as the Gateway, which will be assembled this decade. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Malsha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. Now we move on to the updates of the COVID crisis around the world. The WHO is warning that the Delta variant, known to be the more transmissible than the original, is on track to become the world's dominant COVID-19 strain. The variant is fueling cases in many parts of the world, including the United States and Europe. The World Health Organization says the highly contagious Delta variant has now been identified in 124 countries and is expected to become the dominant strain within months. This is 13 more countries than the previous week. The WHO also said the global number of COVID-19 cases jumped 12 percent on week with over 190 million accumulated cases so far. The U.S. is one country experiencing the rampant spread of the Delta strain, with COVID-19 cases nearly tripling over the past two weeks. The country is also reporting more COVID-19 infections among children who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. The American Academy of Pediatrics says over 23,000 child COVID-19 patients were reported between July 8th and 15th, nearly twofold the number seen in late June. Amid the continued spread of the Delta variant, American health experts are stressing the importance of getting vaccinated. As new cases surge in Britain, its Prime Minister, Treasury Chief and the leader of the main opposition Labour Party are under self-quarantine after being exposed to COVID-19. Germany is also grappling with the Delta variant, with its health minister warning the public that if case numbers keep rising at the current pace, the country could see the number of infections per 100,000 people over the course of a week to exceed 400 in September. Over 50 million people, or 60 percent of Germany's total population, have received at least one COVID-19 shot. 
about 47% are fully vaccinated. Coronavirus cases in Australia spiked again despite a weeks-long lockdown with authorities warning that infections would rise more and take a toll on the economy as the country battles to contain the highly contagious Delta variant. Let's cross over to other than the World News Special Correspondent Timothy Philip who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia for more. Timothy? Yes, Jenna. A third state went into lockdown this week. Stay-at-home orders are now in place in South Australia, Victoria and parts of New South Wales. Many people have expressed frustration at being back in highly policed lockdowns 18 months into the pandemic. Fewer than 14% of people are vaccinated, the worst rating among OECD nations. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has been heavily criticised over the slow vaccination rate, but has resisted calls to apologise. Until recently, Australia's strategy of border closures, quarantine programmes and snap lockdowns have helped keep cases low. But the highly contagious Delta variant has challenged these defences in the past month. The outbreak in Sydney, Australia's largest city, has infected more than 1,500, despite the city being in a lockdown for a fourth week. There are fears Sydney's lockdown could extend into September. Australian authorities have said they intend to eliminate local cases completely until a majority of the people are vaccinated. But in Sydney, eliminating cases could take months. Back to you, Shanae. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. People wanting to go to cinemas, museums, sporting matches and other cultural venues in France will have to show proof of COVID-19 vaccination or a negative test as the country faces a spike in the cases from the highly transmissible Delta variant. This is set to become a very familiar sight for people in France. A health pass is now compulsory in certain cultural and leisure venues such as theme parks, museums, cinemas, theatres, gyms and libraries. The document is proof that someone is either fully vaccinated, has tested negative in the last 48 hours or has recently recovered from Covid. A move by the government which has sparked some controversy but has been welcomed by others. Venues have been racing to prepare for the new measure. Paris's aquarium has urgently recruited four employees and has bought the technology needed. Masks will not be compulsory in venues where a health pass is required. Fines will be issued to businesses who do not check their customers' passes. En gros, c'est quoi C'est nous les gendarmes aujourd'hui, c'est nous la police et en plus on a un bâton qui qui peut nous tomber dessus si on fait pas bien la police. Je je suis un peu dubitatif. The government has said there will be some flexibility this week. A wider extension of the health pass that will cover bars and restaurants will take effect at the beginning of August. Employees in venues where a health pass is required for entry will have until the end of August to get fully vaccinated. Welcome back and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Disgraced Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein pleaded not guilty in a courtroom in Los Angeles to all 11 charges of rape and sexual assault against five women in California hotel rooms. G20 summit environment and energy ministers kicked off a two-day meeting in Nepal, shared by Italy after catastrophic floods swept across northwestern Europe last week and China. Russia's fifth-generation light multipurpose fighter made its debut at the 15th International Aviation and Space Station, which opened in the capital Moscow. Russia's state-owned corporation Rostec unveiled the fifth-generation single-engine fighter targeted overseas markets at the air show. India's farmers protesting against new agricultural laws say that they threaten their livelihoods, stated a city near parliament in capital renewing a push for repealing the laws. And finally tonight, NASA scientists said the Mars rover Perseverance is about to begin its historic hunt for signs of ancient life on the Red Planet. The rover has been working seven days a week to test the practice with its various sophisticated instruments, which will start taking soil samples soon from the Jezero crater, which scientists believe was once a lake bed about 40 kilometers wide and possible caked with dried mud that may hold evidence of potential primitive life. 
NASA Perseverance Mars rover project scientist Ken Farley said during a news conference they are looking very far back in the history to solar systems while announcing some of the early scientific results of the rover. Scientists believe the meteor impact that formed the Jezero crater likely created an environment friendly to life. There is an evidence of ancient river flow into Jezero forming a delta that has long since been dry. It says the rover instrument revealed the crater contains clay which only forms in a presence of water. Farley described the current environmental conditions of Jezero, says rover has sent back fascinating images of wind gusts and dust devils which just like on earth are vortices that lift dust into the air. Amongst the questions the scientists are hoping to one day answer in whether the soil in Jezero is sedimentary or volcanic and whether the ancient lake that once filled Jezero went through multiple episodes of filing up and drying down again. Other experiments carried out by the rover include MOXIE whose purpose is to demonstrate for future missions and ability extract oxygen from the carbon dioxide atmosphere. The rover has done three MOXIE runs to date and those were successful. The experiment will help provide future missions oxygen for human astronauts to breathe. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.